Hello, we are here at DLD Summer 2015 with the CEO of Care.com. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, yeah, so how do you enjoy the event so far? Thanks, Chris. I'm really enjoying it. It's a oh, great, yeah. innovative event focused on health, technology, and lifestyle. So uh, you came, uh, you're, you've been to Europe for quite some time because um, you actually uh, took over Betreut.de, which, uh, which was big news here in Germany. Not, it doesn't happen so many times. So uh, I was wondering, how, how has the integration been going? We visit very often, and certainly when we acquired Detroit in the summer of 2012, we were very thrilled because we shared the same mission and that there was a huge overlap in culture. The co-founder, Stefan and Manuel, and I shared the same vision and the mission of the company. And the challenges that we faced in the beginning was, how are we going to do the technical integration? And there was a lot of debate, whether we were going to use the existing platform or think of a scalable platform, because we had launched the UK on care.com on what we call Sterling as a platform. And so we decided to actually migrate 13 countries, and it took us a year and a half to do the technical integration. But we're so glad we did that investment, because Because now we're able to give the Detroit team all the knobs and levers to really optimize the platform, uh, innovate faster, uh, leverage the power of technology from both the German team as well as the team in the U.S. So we're thrilled, thrilled, thrilled with the integration. So, so to understand it correctly, you turned off the, the website that has been running and or migrated over to the Care.com platform? We actually migrated Detroit.de to a new international platform that we called Sterling. We took an organic hit with Google, and as many entrepreneurs know, that's a risk to take. But we felt like in the long term, that was the right investment for the company. And now we're seeing the significant growth. So we're excited we made that decision. But initially, it was a high risk. But it was the right thing to do. Cool. Yeah, um, so something that's really interesting from my perspective, uh, it's not happening so many times, but a uh, very interesting topic. So you IPO'd the company in 2014, and um, I must, uh, um, I assume it's a big change for you also as an entrepreneur. So maybe you can walk us through the changes that have, have happened uh, in terms of being a public co company and before being a startup. So, you know, being a founder and now being a public company CEO certainly had both the benefits and challenges. I was very optimistic that I'd learn. I think the key thing we decided with the entire management team right before we went public, it was about the summer of 2013, I said to the team, let's figure out how to disrupt ourselves. How do we make sure that we're the team that can scale this and take it to the next level? And I think every entrepreneur needs to do that. Disrupt your platform, disrupt your teams, and how do you make sure you can innovate as you grow as a company? And so we did that, and some of the founders came up to me uh, shortly after IPO and said, we need more mobile talent. We need better product innovation talent. And a couple of my co-founders let go of their positions, and we hired some terrific new, new blood, new talent, really focused on innovation. And so we have to do that constantly. And so the big difference for us, no matter whether you're small or in large scale, is constantly be innovating and disrupting yourselves. Do you work more or less after the IPO? I wish I could say that I'm working less. I'm, I'm, I keep thinking that my hours will be reduced, but the demands are very high, but it's something, I, you know, I'm passionate. I love waking up every morning because I love what I do and I love the team. Cool, very great. So um, you have about 500 employees now. Um, it's always interesting also for founders to see what are the typical challenges that a big company faces versus a small company. So maybe you can also tell us a little bit about the, the changes you had to go through in terms of people, processes, and, and how maybe also your role changed over the years. Yeah, so the key thing to invest is to make sure that you're constantly investing in people, processes, prioritization at every stage of the game. And obviously you're going to put more processes when it's a larger company. The downside with that is that layer bureaucracies actually starts to impact efficiency, innovation, and trust building. So for example, what we do at Care.com is we move everybody around every year to a different seat and they don't sit with their same teams. So we have technology, creative, marketing, all sitting in the same area, as opposed to just the marketing team. It reduces tribalism in the company. It allows for more collaboration. So we're constantly thinking about how do we create um, a culture of change, which is important. And how my role has changed is I invest quite a bit of time on culture and on people. I would say over 50% of my time is spent on people issues and people opportunities, uh, and how we're constantly thinking about how do we scale this culture. Uh, do you have an HR, head of HR? 
We do. We've got a, a chief people person. It's uh, Al Zink. He is phenomenal. Uh, and he and I have uh, known each other for a number of years. He worked at a previous company. And so we, we trust each other a lot. And he's built an incredible HR team focused on recruiting, retaining, and professional development of our employees. Do you have some? Do you have something that you can share with the audience, uh, like a typical question that you ask in an interview that maybe a founder out there who's hiring his first person can also ask? Um, what I typically will ask, um, especially on a blind reference when you're calling somebody to follow up on on a on a candidate, I will often ask, "What number candidate would you hire this person if you were to rehire them again?" Would they be the first hire or will they be the 10th hire? Because it give you an indication of high, how high quality this candidate is to someone who previously worked with them. So if, if, the, um, if the person is very passionate, he'll probably say number one. Otherwise, it'll be two, three, and five. And that's probably not the right one for you. Yeah. Exactly. I mean, I think it will vary depending on situation, but if I'm hiring a top executive to be my right-hand person or a top executive in a critical area in the company, it will matter to me a lot that when I'm doing the blind reference, is this someone that someone's prioritizing? Yeah. Um, you also told me that you're really passionate about female entrepreneurship. So uh, in your opinion, what do you think has to change in order to get more female entrepreneurs uh, onto the road? I think we have to change the pipeline. Um, I, I hear in Germany it's only 10% are female funded uh, companies, especially uh, startups, especially in the technology space. So a couple of messages. If you are a male leader, invest in your women. And if you are a female leader, put your voice out there. Speak, be a role model for other women so that we can have more of a pipeline. Of, of female entrepreneurs that can then spawn other companies with female entrepreneurs. And as we know, and many investors know this, that if you invest in women, you get better outcomes and better ROI. Sorry guys, got to work harder. So I think it's really critical and important to showcase that, especially if you're a male leader, is to encourage the women in your company to have a voice, to speak up, and to be a role model. And the most important thing too, is whether you're a male leader or female leaders, invest in your employees, provide them care benefits, provide work-life balance, understand the challenges for families. And I think that's really important. I will say one of the key things I've learned through our integration with Detroit is that the Germans have put out this, you pronounce the... Uh, Elterngeld. Plus, plus right? Elterngeld plus, yeah. Starting on July 1st, and I think it's amazing that we're providing a generic maternity, paternity leave, family leave that makes it important for families to make sure that they have work-life balance. It's something that the U.S. can learn from, and I think that's just the start of our integration of both our cultures, and there's a lot we can learn from each other. Thank you very much for the interview. Thank you, Chris.